you saying you know, a little bit about yourselves and we can start with a couple of questions and then see if you guys have anything you want to learn. Okay? Sure. Um, okay. I, my company works under actually a larger branch called Foodstat. We handle training slash consulting for both individuals and corporate. So, a little background about what, we, uh, what my company does. Kind of my specific background actually is twofold. It's both English and statistics. I would not recommend people actually come from the English side actually if you're looking at the data science field. It has its advantages. But uh, it's a very difficult transition. So for those of you who are looking more from maybe a non-STEM field, uh, specifically of like what are suggestions, I can definitely give you guys some. But if you're coming from a STEM field, I'll definitely say like it's, uh, it is definitely easier. All right. Okay. Uh, I I'm, my name is Yun Bao. I'm from Nigeria, which is a consulting company, and uh, our client are uh, almost uh, all the major pharmaceutical companies are our client. So in our company, what we do is uh, we make, uh, we mainly focus on two tasks. One is clinical trial optimization. The other is pharmaceutical marketing research. And uh, for both of these these two tasks, we need to uh, we need big data and machine learning. Uh, I will elaborate more on the details about how we do this later later on. And my major will be electrical and computer engineering. So I'm Spencer Spencer Nails. Uh, work at DSF Corporation. I think in some respect I represent uh, in this at least in this group I, I represent the chemical and manufacturing industries because the companies that uh, are in the same space as ours they are typically similarly set up. Uh, so what we do is we, we manufacture manufacture uh, commodity chemicals but also speciality chemicals. So everything. Uh, Value chain, so it's always difficult to think that you're active in the entire chemical market. There's a lot that is being produced there, and so we, we cover a fair share of the uh, market in chemicals in general, be it fibers, be it ag chemicals, be it cosmetics, detergents, and nutritional chemicals, uh, pharmaceuticals. But uh, with the distinction that we are not uh, developing medicine, but we are actually only producing active ingredients developed by others. Um, and uh, so in terms of data, we, we generate tons of data uh, in different corners of the company. It starts at uh, product development, which is actually what my focus is going to be in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, but then after product development, you get to manufacture it, production plan, generate tons of data, even on a microsecond level, uh, quality, lab data, and then it goes into the business. So we, we also uh, do a lot of time series analysis, forecasting, um, market strategic marketing, and uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, and we try, of course, we try to match those data with the real life world that we are in producing uh, chemicals. Um, can you expand on the application for semantic analysis towards a chemical manufacturing company? Sentiment analysis? Yeah, the question is sentiment analysis. Different. <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, for us, it is actually also uh, very important to know what how we are being perceived. Uh, so there you go into uh, looking into what people are posting in, in social media and how they are reacting to our posts. Uh, and uh, so all of that is, of course, it's more important in the customer focus industries than in, in the commodity chemicals. So if you focus on commodity chemicals, which is still a large part of what our commodity company does, uh, operating a steam cracker, it doesn't, it doesn't really yeah, that dependent on the customer sentiment. Uh, but then on the other hand, if you're producing uh, active ingredients for detergents, for example, uh, then you do want to know if people react positively to it being biodegradable or to it being bio-based. Uh, because then you can estimate if people are pos uh, positive in, in, in that respect, then they might be willing to pay a premium for a product that is bio-based. Uh, and based on that, you can also uh, change the economic or adapt the economics uh, to build a business case to start producing one of those ingredients based on an alternative raw material, which you didn't do before because you thought it was not economic. 
Sure. How do you codify that? I mean, you're saying what they're posting and stuff like that. How do you, I mean, you know, used to be in, in the old days they would do user service, which were easy to codify because you, you know, A, B, C, D, etc. But if you're if you're trying to analyze Twitter posts and Facebook posts and things like that, how do you codify that? Yeah, there you get a, a lot of uh, unstructured data and then you go into the natural language processing uh, and uh, you know you know factors like an LPK that have a lot of options to actually extract uh, features out of uh, a vast space of unstructured data, classify it, uh, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of this. <laughs> well, actually, um, natural language processing saying that is core is if you look at foundational steps, it's actually fairly interpretable. Uh, people have a lot of black box models, but the black box models in terms of like where everything like all magical is actually happening at the very end. A lot of natural language processing has more to do with how you choose to transform your text in the first place, which is uh, simply can be something as simple as I split an entire document, and when we say document, it basically stands for the amount of text uh, into just individual words, and you count all of them or whatnot, to sure. I choose to penalize by certain metrics, to I choose to vectorize them through either probability determination or whatnot. So there's a bunch of different like methods from there, but ultimately what it really comes down to a lot of more of it is just, well, how do you want to, the text to look in, in terms of how a computer understands it beforehand? A lot of it comes more down to that. And then ultimately from there on, it really just comes down to what we call model selection from there on. So, yeah, I can expand a little bit on that. Right, right. Uh, working on this natural language processing, I also want to see something. Uh, because the techniques of uh, the natural NLP techniques can be applied in other areas more than processing natural language. An example here is that because when we analyze the patient level data, Every patient has diagnosis, has procedure, and they do some drugs. So every patient can be represented by a sequence. First of all, second one, third one. And uh, this sequence is actually like a sentence. So it's A, B, B, A, things like this. And uh, because every patient, the sequence for every patient has different lengths, right? Different lengths. And uh, you, you want to convert this sequence to a vector because maybe your next step is to do a classification or regression task. Supervised learning. The, but before that, you have to convert this sequence into a vector. Simple way is to use bag of work. I don't know. Uh, basically, just a frequency count of each uh, each work. But a smarter way is to uh, utilize the uh, recurrent neural network. If you, if you know how to train the deep learning neural network, then this is called sentence embedding. And uh, surprisingly, yeah, in, in my case, it's kind of black box. I train a long-term short-term memory, and I vectorize the sequence, and this sequence is a good representation of the, of the original sequence. Yeah, have you heard of word to vec, dot to vec? That yeah, yeah, that's yes, that's it's very simple. It's exactly. actually like one method. So my, my point is that sometimes you use these techniques to deal with se sequence. That's, it, 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 it's not necessary to be a human language. Indeed, oh no, of course not. I mean, in fact, your, yeah. your, yours would be easier. Because there's not there's not a lot of nuance. It's just you know, right, but limitor, you yes. know. But if, if they are really dealing with human language, then they're they're already some pre-trained neural network. Uh, Google and Facebook they, they already trained some neural network. So let's say a word called apple. You know the embedded result of this apple given by Google or Facebook. I, I mean, actually, if if you are dealing with human language, you can leverage the result. Or some big company. Well, in my case, you have to start from zero. Hi. Uh, what's your major? What are you inquiring this point? Sorry. All of you. Mine. My, 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 my. Okay. No, 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 no. I, I. Okay. My major. Uh, although I, uh, I get degree in electrical computer engineering, but my my major, uh, my thesis is statistical signal processing. So signal processing is very correlated with statistics. Uh, I'm, I'm similar. I, I already took uh, so also my uh, as I mentioned my PhD is like I would call it like eighty percent or even more eighty five percent 
high-dimensional data analysis and algorithm development, which is mainly statistics in what I did back then. Presently, I'm, I'm like half a half machine learning. Um, but um, yeah, my thesis was, was not more than 15% chemistry, in spite of it being in a chemical department. Uh, and I even, you know, I did my masters. I really took what I was in the European system, right? So it's not totally comparable to here, but it would be, uh, yeah, selecting subjects that is more or less you know, like corresponding to what a major would be here, more or less. So it would be chemical uh, chemistry, but with with a major in, in analytics, something like that. So that's how I would classify it. Yeah, all right. So, but yeah, I think none of us per se took uh, a master in data science, mainly because... Right, yeah, that's my other question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it kind of didn't exist. In your point of view, yeah. are you going to define data science as a branch of statistics, or just a new thing? Just I, can, I can take this far as you guys also agree, but I would say, first of all, something to uh, keep in mind. I'd be very hard pressed to think of any STEM based PhDs that does not require a heavy concentration of statistics. I can't even think of any, like literally, out of any of them. Uh, so, because statistics as a whole, and in regards to your question, it has its fingers in so many pie, right? And in fact, and, and to follow up to that point to your current question, data science is, effectively speaking, I would say, it's not necessarily a branch of statistics, but it is definitely an offshoot where statistics plays a heavy part in. Because the reason why I would say it is not a branch of statistics is because data science now has now become this nebulous term where you have folks doing, like, for example, data visualization, and you might say, like, well, they're not a data scientist. But what if their method, like, in order to properly visualize, requires the scientific method? That's why the term data science exists. It's because the science part comes in from the scientific method. And how much of that is involved in your role can be from like an engineering perspective, for example, in, in terms of understanding data to work with big data architectures. Like that in by itself, of course, would require mathematics. If you can't do like understand the mathematics of it, I don't see how far you're gonna get in terms of creating a platform unless you're simply following just like standard stuff, but then you're running into all sorts of things like efficiencies and so forth. Right? Well, uh, I agree with first. The, uh, in, in my opinion, I think uh, data science uh, major has overlap with uh, statistics, but of course, uh, I don't think it's a branch of statistics. And the second, uh, personally, based on my working experience, if I get a resume major in data science, I think it's a plus. It's a plus compared, to be honest, compared with traditional statistics because. You guys, uh, data science major take more. I think you take more computer science courses. You have more, uh, more coding hands on experience. I don't know, but uh, if that's true, then it's definitely a plus here in data science. And I have a cousin, and uh, I recommend her to uh, apply for the Rutgers data science, uh, data science major master. Yeah, this uh, remark though that yeah, the data yeah, uh, today my perception at least is that data science isn't as normalized as other sciences. So if you get a master of statistics, you kind of know what you're going to get. Whereas with a master of data science, it, it more or less depends on the, the college that it is coming from and what they used to be strong in before they started doing data science. So some data science programs are really heavy on, on architecture and managing the data. Some other data science programs are heavy on statistics, but not as much on the computational aspects. Some other data science programs even are leaning a little bit in the direction of bioinformatics, because that is something that faculty used to be good in. Uh, so I think, yeah, in general, I'm in line with you saying that uh, if you get a guy who can say I have experience or, or a certificate in data science, then it is a little bit more typically a little bit more practical oriented than, for example, a major in statistics. Uh, but it isn't necessarily always applicable to the area you want to apply in. So you have to, you have to more dig a little bit deeper. And uh, in, in this respect, yeah, I didn't do my own work, so I can't talk for others in this case. I don't know where you must have gone. <laughs> yeah, how, what's the population pool here? Is, is there, are there any masters in data science here? Or 
It's what about the undergrads? Data on the grads. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Four different data science programs. Okay, um, I don't know what it's going to look like in a few years, but right now I feel like I, I still feel, to be honest, master of data science is a little still wild west for me too. Yeah. Uh, like for example, if I see it, I, I don't know. Should I ask them about well, what's your knowledge of like what did you use Python or R, or did you use C? Because I really value C because to me I can see that it's translatable to other skills. Like if I need to train you in a language, I don't care. But if you tell me, like for example, when someone tells me they worked in Python and they only use Python, I actually still would very much hesitate to give them some real work because to me that's I, I don't know what that means. Like did they use libraries in Python or did they know how to like handle things? Like for example, if I tell them, okay, I want like we have like memory issues here in this uh, in the current like code, so you have to re rewrite it. Uh, like, would they be able to do that? Like, whereas someone with Java or C low level languages, I have that's reliable to me. Like, and that's something I know from computer science background, for example, or from a statistical background. I can you know like as Ben said, they've done certain concentration of studies. Whereas, for example, I if it's if, if someone says they have an MS in data science, I'm like, okay, up to like what area? Did you work with SVM heavily, or did you work with like trace ensembles? It, it becomes a very difficult, and you have to kind of go with the more. Just like how you guys do, you have to spend a lot of time like worrying about like cutting edge algorithms or sort of like the research that's being done in this space, or how do you do that? Yeah, uh, I think yeah, yeah. actually the, the answer, but I, I don't know if, it, if it's similar for all three of us, but probably, you guys can probably. probably. <laughs> uh, so I think like personally, do, do you have time to, to stay at cutting edge? You don't have very much time, but you don't want to do it. Because you, you want to be, uh, you want to know what the latest developments are, you want to know both in the science and also in the computational aspects, like what is the latest capabilities. But by when 4 comes out, what will it be capable of doing? You want to know that right when it, when it becomes available. Um, do we actively invest in it in our company? Yeah. Uh, so we, we both do, we have uh, an innovation budget in which we can actually spend a certain percentage of our time on research. And we also have active university collaborations. So we uh, uh, have a couple of groups uh, both in, in Europe and, and also here in the US uh, where we have individual topics that are being taken care of in a collaboration uh, project where a PhD student is working on them, for example. Okay, in my case, it's very similar. First, we need innovation. Second, we have collaborations with academia. And uh, talking about the innovation part, because in the consulting industry, People make money from uh, two things. One is that they keep selling the same thing, same thing to this company, long-term service. It's a uh, consulting, and uh, but at the same time, after after, let's say after one year, you have to update the service. Then that's a that's a part you where you need the innovation. So both innovation and the constant service are important in consulting. <coughs> so okay, talking about this innovation, uh, let's say because. If we want to make a prediction on our on the patient, then maybe using the old model get this accuracy. But next year you want the accuracy to be this high. So you have to because it's real real demand, real world demand, you have to go go to Google and search how to solve this. And uh, let's say because in my case I need to do feature automation, so I go go to search and then I know about the current neural network. I to be honest, before uh, before this project, I, I have very limited knowledge about the uh, recurrent neural network. But at, at least right now, I know how to call it and uh, how to do it back in things. Yeah. Not, not, I'm not saying I can go there very deep, but at least I can apply it. Yeah, I could that sentiment. Um, but my company doesn't have the same budget for uh, basically re uh, research and development, effectively speaking. But you just end up having to do it by proxy. Uh, you get some you get projects and then you look at them and then you say, realize wait I don't know how to do this at all and you end up having to basically spend your time to do the research anyway so it's just out of demand but on top of that then um, to a keep relevant with the field but also uh, you very often uh, I don't know if you guys have to encounter this you get uh, either companies where like for example clients or your boss hears of some new thing and they're like, it'll be great if we can operate this and you're in charge of operating this. 
this. And it doesn't even necessarily get implemented. In fact, most of the time, it doesn't get implemented. But they just want to like see like what they can do, and then you're in charge of just like researching it. Like in my case, off the clock sometimes. Um, and then to also pay back on top of that, just, that's the main reason also why PhDs and also MS are to a lesser degree are so highly valued in the field is because they need the research mentality. Like someone who actually likes it or has a good track record. Because otherwise, it just becomes like, well, yeah, you can just. Look at data science and be like, well, just import pandas and you know, go from there. Okay. Uh, so I work for Celgene, it's a pharmaceutical company, and that by default involves constant R and D innovation. Uh, but it's fragmented. So my primary responsibility is to support a commercial organization. My job is to support sales and marketing initiatives. If I put out a campaign, is that campaign actually returning uh, on its investment? But because it's an R&D firm, I also play, I mean, um, uh, there's an R&D wing to a pharma firm. I also play an advisory role when I'm working with, let's say, drug safety or clinical operation people. So there's always a push for um, efficiency, seeking efficiencies when it comes to any activity on the R&D side. So a very, very simple example that I was talking to somebody yesterday, uh, when it comes to drug safety, one of the most classic examples of a huge time sink when it comes to R&D is reading papers, and you have no idea how much we pay to read papers. But it's a fundamental thing because everybody's publishing new stuff on clinical research, on product safety, on drug safety, on interactions. This is thing. This this is stuff that you have to keep on top of. But perhaps I don't need to read 300 pages to figure out that maybe this doesn't work well with my drug, or I don't need to read 330 pages out of 300 to figure out okay, this is not pertaining to the particular issue that I'm trying to research. So one of the basic skills that we're trying to find now is, is there a way for me to bring, excuse me, for me to bring out the essence of a paper through an automated fashion, through a model that somehow is able to bring down a thousand, three thousand words down to five topics that capture what I'm trying to find. So we're now going into like NLP and into topic modeling and into classification of text in an automated fashion. And that is something that is maybe very recent and is very common in, this, in the environment of Google or in, in Facebook, but pharma is like 20, maybe 30 years behind in the space. So for us, that's innovation. And that is something that's cutting edge to us, and that continues on in various other environments. So it depends on what you're looking for in innovation. If you're trying to be cutting edge in new statistical methodology and new application Maybe not necessarily, but if you're trying to find a new way to solve a problem, and that approach may be old, but it's a it's a, um, a a break from the status quo, then yes, that happens all the time, and that depends on how you want to go about doing it. If you want to be on the bleeding edge of R, writing the latest algorithm, no. But if you want to be using an algorithm that's three years old on thirty different ways that could solve problems that save you $50 million, that's a lot, that's innovation in itself. Uh, the goals that the company and where they're going, while you're, you don't have actually, you know, the necessary tools to build them on, mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that in your daily life? Are we going to do this one? Oh, this way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> most companies, data is secondary. In fact, most, uh, if you're working, your primary application or your primary product is data, either you're in a service industry or you are selling that data in a unique way, like Facebook as a sad example perhaps. <laughs> but um, for, for most companies, in fact, I'll, I'll keep going, so I used to be a consultant about a year ago and I've worked in five, maybe six different industries and everywhere it's Data is recognized as an asset that can help improve the function that you're supporting. So in my current role, I support commercial operations. So for me, data should help support that operation, right? It's how can I leverage the insight, not necessarily the raw data, because for example, I see uh, daily sales volumes of five different drugs. That in and of itself may, may not be very useful. But if somehow I'm able to build a model that says, hey, based on the trend, you're probably going to have 
an additional bolus of volume that's going to come in next month. And guess what? You don't have the inventory to support that demand. So I can now directly impact the way my operations are, are working to improve my efficiency, to, to ensure that I'm able to meet the demand in the market, as an example. So data transformed into insights to support the operations to drive either the top line or the bottom line. That's like 90% of the use case that I've been in in almost every industry. But if you want to be specifically working in data alone, it kind of goes back to the, the, the rough conversation we were having around R&D. There will be a wing in most companies-ish, now there will be probably, around R&D of just turning data into insight. So, for example, when I was uh, in Southern, I was working at Ernst Young where I'm trying to sell my service. I need to make money by billing you my hours. And the easiest way for me to do that is to come back and answer, hey, you have a problem. Either you don't have the capacity to solve it or you don't have the capability to solve it. Capability becomes a bigger and easier sell because one of the challenges in consulting is uh, recurring revenue. You have a problem now, I solve it. After that, you don't have a problem. How am I going to make money? <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty major problem for me now. So recurring revenue would be the easiest way is if you have an R&D wing inside your firm that says, I know that in this industry there's a problem that happens all the time. Let me see if I can build a product, a database product, that can somehow solve this problem, and now I can give you that product and say, hey, you have this data, I have a product that takes the data and provides you value. I'm going to charge you $50,000 a month for that. And now I have recurring income that I've solved. So more often than not, the way i found it is, if you're in a company that has a, a product or a service that you're selling, data is an augmentation exercise. Whereas if you are working in a company that primarily runs and uses data, then for you to find data as either a service or a product, and you need to figure out how best you can use that uh, in, in driving the top or bottom line. At the end of the day, you write the phone. Uh, I was at a talk a couple days back from a guy who does uh, MRI analysis. Yeah. And it turns out that there are about 20 or 30 complete MRIs that you can get access to for research purposes. But every time you want to use that data, well, you have to tell them what you want to search for, and it costs for a university or for a company $20,000. And if you're going to look for something else in the MRIs, you have to pay them again. <coughs> and that's for a university. And for companies, it's like, it's like 100000 So, So what he said about data as being, as being having data warehouses is absolutely correct. And the more complex the data, the more expensive it becomes. And a, an absolute example from two days ago. Uh, we signed a contract. Uh, I won't give you the exact numbers, but I can give you estimates of averages, I guess. Is claims data. Claims data is a treasure. So if you're living in the world of insurance, if you're living in the world of healthcare, essentially claims data will tell you, as a patient, <coughs> I received a service from a hot doctor, and of course I have insurance, but I can't afford to pay $10,000 for uh, checking my temperature. So my insurance will pay for it. So, <laughs> That's pretty accurate. It's terrifying. But what then usually happens in this insurance process, there's some middle agency. I send my claim to them, they found the insurance company, and they collect this massive amount of data. I work in a company that specializes in a very tiny portion of the medical industry. We solve cancer problems and very specific types of cancers. So it happens that they're rare and they don't happen too often, and therefore we're very good at it. But we don't have a very major population. And yet, for the portion of the claims data, for me to be able to say, what is the patient behavior like? What are the doctors doing? What are the hospitals doing? What are the uh, insurance companies doing? For me to capture the claims data for just my world, on average, annually, somewhere in the mid tens of millions, depending on how deep of the data I want, on average, that's how much it costs. Now, if I were to work at Merck, as an example, and Merck is massive compared to my company, Mark is probably paying, I don't want to throw numbers out because I actually probably know the actual numbers, but let's say like 15-ish million dollars for just claims data, and that's every year. Is that where they buy from? Oh yeah, I do. I As I said, most of the bigger pharmaceutical companies are our client, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
the, uh, we, we, before we name ourselves as Acuria, yeah. uh, we used to name ourselves as IMS, but the IMS is a major player in the yes. data. We don't buy from them, guess what? There's another company, it's not as good as IMS, I'll give you that, but we buy from a company that doesn't have a particular um, rule in their contract. With IMS, there used to be a rule that if you buy right. data from them, you're going to give your data to them as well. So their data yeah. just becomes bigger and bigger the more people buy from them. So now Acuvia covers uh, almost 88% of the clean now data in the United States. And yeah. also it's worldwide, in Europe, in China, in South Asia, uh, many, many places. Yeah. And the numbers that throughout are just for US. So it gets more and more if you want to buy from him. And also, we, we actually can't get not only from the uh, insurance company. That's, of course, one major source. Some other sources like the CVS and the Wolverine, the, the pharmacies, yes. the pharmacies. Because when you get a patient get his drug, he, he, the prescription automatically goes to the pharmacy. Uh, pharmacy. So it, it, it can be more efficient. If yeah. you sign a contract with CVS, then sign a contract with uh, or Walmart and also Wolverine. With this, just with this three big three, you get maybe 50% of the data nowadays. Especially the RX data. Uh, but the uh, question here is that you know when you, when you don't have this, uh, if, you, if you're in that situation like that Saudi company, uh, you only have this just limited amount of data. If you're in that situation, what would you, how can you handle that data uh, and make insights? As you mentioned, that you're you know using insights to make. Um, just to make decisions after. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, is everyone here in the staff program? Or are we just kind of open up in here? Okay. Uh, so, this is where statistics come into play. I am a master in statistics, and I used to live in the quads program, quads building right over there, and I hate all of you because Livingston is a much better place now than when I was here. You have a movie theater. Nope. Get out of here. Um, this, the, the statistics is. I, okay, I break it into two, right? Most of the time, my work is machine learning. It's I have a lot of data, and I want to somehow um, minimize my search to exactly what I want. And I can somehow build some sort of a constraint-based model that I can throw onto the data. Uh, but when I don't have a lot of data, and I have just a little bit, and I have a big problem to solve, I'm trying to find core principles, right? It's if I know only if I only have this much, what is the essence of that exercise? So as a I don't want to go too deep, but the point of let's say a statistical distribution when you have a normal distribution, a very few set of numbers gives you a lot of information about the totality of the data that you have. Much in that same exercise, I'm trying to think. Um, very recently we ran a survey of a very small subset of doctors in the world that I live in, and it's not at all inclusive of the of the, um, the the total world of my clients and my customers. But based on the little survey, I can somehow extrapolate out of that some fundamentally um, underlying assumptions. And of course, there there are assumptions that I have to make on top of it because I am working with small data. But the idea is for me to find what might be the most consistent or the most applicable across the universe that I don't have this ability. I only see this much, and I want to be able to understand all of it. I have to make some base assumptions. So, on top of those assumptions and some range that I allow around those assumptions, I estimate out into the wider world, and that's the actual study and application of probability and statistics. So, when you have little data, you have to extrapolate. You have a lot of data, you have you have more freedom, but a lot of data has its own problems. So, that's the job of somebody who works in the field with data. Is there, is, is there another I answer that you guys have? don't know this field enough to be able to actually make any comment, like the scenario. Yeah. But ultimately, um, like questions like that can't, you really can't answer without more information. Because it comes more, a lot more down to like when people say like, well, I don't have enough data, right? When they give you like a small amount <coughs> of data, they don't sometimes even understand what the problem is. Like, before they, whereas they're just saying like, can you do something with it? And very often, like the answer is like, yes, you can always do something with it. But like, what I can do may not be what you want. Like for example, to me, like you can talk about like, 
do one-on-one -on -one simulation, right? To grow your data, do you want to? I, I, like for example, if so, you don't have as much data, you can actually pay people to get data, even for whatever, like in whatever method, or we, or do more field research, or for example, examine whether or not there are existing examples of instances where there is a lot of data that you can extract that to your specific problem. So as a result, because of the nature of what I can I don't really actually quite know how I would even have it. Yeah, uh, I, I had a discussion with him before this, before this uh, meeting, and uh, I, I, in my opinion, something might not be doable. Something is doable. There is a limit uh, of our of, of machine learning. Because if, let's say, it's a, it's a small data set, let's say if you are lucky, you, although the data size is small, but it's very representative, then still you can get some insight there. But what if this data is full of noise, and uh, it's not representative, Less correlated with what you want to predict. In such case, uh, maybe even with the best model, with the, with the best functional model, you still get something barely better than random guess. Then, in such case, uh, you, you have to evaluate the quality of the data before you do anything and evaluate the task, whether it's predictable or not. So, for example, let's say if I want you to predict the stock price of two days later, that's not global, I think. So, so that's my answer. So you better compare the data with what the thing you want to predict. Are they really correlated enough? Yeah, I think actually getting back to the point of data, it was for me a very, very interesting perspective that for you guys, I, mean, I know it's going on like that in the pharmaceutical industry that you actually have to buy a lot of data. Uh, we as a company, we don't buy that much of data, so most of the data we would generate ourselves uh, particularly if you think about manufacturing, we have our own production plants, we have massive production plants with thousands of sensors on them. Each of these sensors generates data uh, on, on, the, even on a microsecond level, it just uh, becomes a decision as, as to what is actually being recorded, what is being retained, what becomes part of the data history. Uh, their data scientist also has to look at uh, yeah, at which time frame is it relevant to use the data for the, for the analysis that you're looking at. Because it might be, it might actually be uh, true that the criterion that you are trying to extract out of the data, you can only verify it every two days, and then it doesn't really make sense to extract microsecond data, right? So then you have to, to work with a certain degree of aggregation in order to make things match up. Um, but yeah, in that world, basically, most or all of the data that we use are data that we generate, uh, with exception of some data on raw materials that we purchase. Uh, sometimes we also use better data, but they are publicly available, you could just draw them. Um, the only place where we would go out and buy data is actually on, on the markets that we're active in. So things for certain products, pricing uh, is, is very important and pricing is not always public. So there are consultant companies that actually call buyers, so the companies that would be our clients, but also our competitors' clients, and they call them. And they do a market study and they assess a, yeah, a consensus price. Uh, so that is something that we would actually be purchasing. Uh, those data there, as soon as you speak about that, uh, you're actually not getting a higher precision than once a week. And that is even that is only for, for commodities where there is a lot of players in the market where these consultants can think they can make a lot of budget by having a weekly price. Uh, just like more default would be once a month to get a quote like that. Of course, we also uh, you know, we extract market data. We use, we use Bloomberg uh, in order to get prices. There we go. We go up to a pretty high frequency, not what a bank would call high frequency, but would still uh, to a minute level we, 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 we dive down. Um, now, uh, yeah, a second, a second <coughs> comment that I, that, that I really appreciated hearing is this. this what well, you said about uh, the sample that you have being representative of a population, because that is basically it is the basic assumption of, of parametric statistics. So there is there is a model up there that is describing the population, and we have a sample, and we have the sample is going to learn us what the parameters of this model up yeah. there are. From. But yeah, there, the two questions are: at first, the model up there is it right? And uh, secondly, is the sample representative to, to 
who actually draw this inference. Uh, but nonetheless, I think realizing that we are doing that all the time which is really important because uh, some, some, some people, you, you, you walk out in the streets, uh, you would say like, we like statistics. And they would say, oh, statistics? Statistics is like either the association that is like boring or difficult or uh, you know, something that I had in high school, you know, they told me that and it was like half a semester and I really hated it. Uh, but then, then if you ask like, you know, yeah, but uh, how do you select your doctor? Uh, and then, then they go out, yeah, yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm, I might actually go to Zorkdok and see what the ratings are. Uh, and see what people read, or I might talk to relatives. So, and then, yeah, how, how, how many reviews do you look at? About, you know, about 50 something? So, what you're doing there is basically you're looking at a small sample uh, out of the total number of patients the guy has in the thousands, likely. You take a small sample and you draw a conclusion based on that small sample. What you're doing there is statistics. Actually, people are doing statistics all the time, even those that are averse of it are doing statistics all the time. Uh, and I think it's really good to keep in mind that we also, as modelers, that that is what we do with uh, yeah, typically big data. So, uh, it's like diversion from the topics what we were discussing. So, uh, how does a computer science student uh, right now, in the sense, uh, enters into the world of data science or preparing himself or a profession into this domain. So what is the start and basically what are things which are presumed to be wrong about data science as a student if people make it wrong? Uh, since I'm currently looking to hire three people, I can actually answer that. Uh, the two things that I've found to be the biggest problems when I'm trying to hire people right now, so I actually interviewed somebody yesterday who, who exhibited both these problems. One is a fear that there's a lack of depth in your knowledge. Data science is a new field. There's a, there's a plethora of publicly available information. You can learn a lot just by going and Googling stuff. I mean, go to Coursera and there's an entire study on data science. You can probably figure out everything by yourself, actually. Almost to a master's level of understanding. But all most companies will look for is a superficial level of numerical capability. Are you able to do fundamental calculus and are you able to understand context? And number two is application. And this is something that I find most lacking. Uh, so for example, uh, this person's not from Rutgers. I interviewed somebody yesterday who comes from an Ivy League school. Clearly very smart lady, very capable, had a ridiculously high GPA, a whole bunch of scholarships, I was like, oh, phenomenal. Let's sit down and talk about things. Uh, it took me 30 minutes to recognize that she spent a great deal of time learning a ridiculous amount of depth in the regression space, so building regression models. That's a, that in and of itself is a fairly large exercise and there's a lot of things you can do in there. And she learned to a level that I did not expect from somebody who's going to graduate uh, soon uh, from an undergraduate degree. And then I asked her, all right, well, how did you apply this? What are some of the examples? How, how do you think, if I gave you a problem, you would employ these skills that you've learned? And there was, uh, let's say, not quite as confident an answer as a result of, of those questions, right? So if you're going to learn something, I personally, in fact, uh, I wasn't in this room, but I was just a little bit further down the road my sophomore year. I took uh, intermediate econo uh, economics by, I can't remember the professor's name, but he came into the class, he took the, the textbook, he quickly flipped through the textbook, walked to the edge, and threw it in the trash, and then started the class. That was my first day of intermediate economics. Because one of the challenges with economics is it's very theoretical, and he wanted to make sure that as a secondary course that we were able to transfer that into a day-to-day -day application. That's fundamental and necessary. So you could learn unbelievable amounts of mathematics, but if I can't ask you to quickly apply those mathematics to a problem that I have, and I'm not going to ask you for challenging problems in an interview, I'm going to ask you for things that have a very clean, linear approach to the solution. And if you can't answer those, that's a big problem. So for you to get into the field, I would do a two-step approach. One, just pick one simple topic, get to a point where you're able to do an MVP, a minimum viable product. So, uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, so I was gonna say that, um, I think it also depends on what industry you're going into. I agree with like a lot of the idea, which is 
ultimately good if you're if you're the assignment and you're there to problem solve, right? You keep hearing like problem solve, but like, and problem solving is obviously not like here's a mathematic equation, derive it for me, et cetera, et cetera. It's more like uh, and the typical interview question you will usually see is here's a sample data set, here are questions we're interested in finding, and usually when you examine those questions, you have to know what is the real question you're asking. Not just here are some standard results like rules I learned from school, but here's how I thought about like, and very often they often say like, this is a bonus question, you don't have to worry too much about it, and you almost always like that question you have to worry about. Um, but at the same time, I do want to also say, if you're going into something that is more engineering heavy, you do need to know algorithms, and you do need to know data structures. They're very often tested from engineering side, data science decisions I've seen. And if you want to go into, for example, anything that is related to finance, you better know your math because they definitely will test fairly some questions where, like, I think probably the hardest math like interview questions I've seen are from hedge funds. Yeah, because then I look at those are the ones where I look at them like, okay, like most interview questions when like people ask me like, oh, can I help you them out with it? I'll be like, yeah, just do this, this, and this. But like for like. The one from like when they show me the one from the hedge fund, uh, the one from I think two sigma, where I literally was like out of ten questions, I'm like I only know two of these answers. <laughs> like you're on your own fidelity, I don't know what you're gonna do there. And like <laughs> help for a really nice guy <laughs> to read it or something. So you, it depends on where you also want to go. Just take that with, uh, keep that in mind as well. If you're looking at like just uh, starting off, I would say. Um, an internship is not a bad idea. Be very humble. Be just willing to show that you have room for growth and room to learn. That's what they're going to look for. Is that natural inquisitive mindset and the work ethic. So don't shy out from that. And also your passion. If you can't make it up in like your some sort of skill, which unfortunately to be perfectly blunt, as an undergrad you can't, you will not have to usually be able to compete in. You then have to make it up for your passion, which is I. I am so excited about working on this topic. So when I talk about this interview question back to you now, like because usually that's the second call is like, okay, you were just given the problem, you did your coding challenge and so forth. Uh, walk me through it, right? Like how excited you are and your ability to actually properly communicate that excitement is going to go a long way. But later on, you'll find if you're going along the more PhD route, at that point, you better be like really at certain aspects, whether it be like coding or whether it be mathematics. Uh, those do get, like, at various positions, get more and more strict. Uh, I agree most of uh, maybe all, all six things we have just said. And, uh, additionally, I want to point out two things. One is that uh, trying to try to have hands-on experience on real-world data as, as early as possible. I mean, you can go to Kaggle. Kaggle has many valuable real-world data. And uh, because uh, at least in our company, you know, data is very expensive. That's valuable. It's hard to get real world data. In, I don't know. Uh, maybe, but anyway, you, you should expose yourself to real world data as early as possible. And uh, secondly, uh, take a maturing course, undergrad level maturing course. You don't have to understand what is L2 law, what is L1 law, but you should 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 know. If you has an L1 penalty term, then you promote sparsity. That's the undergrad level requirement. Take a course and uh, have some hands-on experience in real-world data. Um, yeah, but then uh, I have to get back to the main question. So uh, I'm actually also I'm, I'm going to hire in a couple of weeks from now, and uh, I will also have interns. So I think a uh, very good point. Internships are really good. Uh, because that is one of the things that I look at if I look at a resume, uh, particularly for young guys like you, then uh, one, of the, one of the things that stands out is the internships. Because you did an internship with company X and it's on topic Y. And what I would ask them there is like, what is the problem they had? What is the problem that you needed to solve? And actually, you would be surprised how few people actually know how to formulate the problem they're working on in a very precise manner. And I think that is actually also a very good skill to work on, to be able to get to the gist of things. Because when you do an interview, the first interview you do will be not much more than half an hour, is what I estimate. Um, and 
in that half an hour, you have to convince and you have to make statements that are to the point. Uh, so, for example, when, when you, if you would be talking to me, I would ask, what is an artificial neural network? Then I do not want to get an answer as to, yeah, there are 10 different algorithms to solve the gradient in backpropagation. No, it's far too much detail. I don't want to know that. I just want to know what is an artificial neural network. Uh, so try for, for each of the, the methods that you're working on or the concepts or the problems that you solve, try to be able to summarize them into very little uh, detail, but very much to the point. Uh, and that will make you much more convincing in the interview. Um, and also, what, what, what I look for is, for these internships, what is your contribution? So not, not just what is the problem, but also, like, I want to know, did you yeah, deliver results to one individual regression analysis that was part of a concept or a project with a million legs that you're not aware of? Or did you actually drive a particular part of it? Uh, because the second would be much more interesting. And uh, I would have, as, as uh, similar to you, I would also have the question like, okay, this is a problem that I have. How would you solve this problem in practice? How would you go about it? And they're not just looking at the math, but also about how would you do it in practice. I would, I would, I would want to hear like, yeah, uh, you know, uh, you get data from, from, from a certain production plan. Um, yeah, one of the things you could do is actually call them and, and, and reach out to them and try to understand what the data is, how the data are being generated. All the students will not do that. They think that there's kind of a barrier because it's like, you know, now you have to talk to people and they're yeah. far away. And uh, so they, they, they try to stay in their digital world. I think it, it really adds value if you if you reach out and you you also make your personal network around the project. Uh, so um, yeah, but then, but then of course yeah, the, the technical issues or the technical aspects I'm, I'm not going to skip them. So I'm, I will ask a couple of individual. So if we get to the detail there, you you start solving this problem in theory, let's say, and then you will mention a couple of ways to implement it or. Uh, machine learning stat schools that you're going to apply them for one of them, I would want to know, like, I will, I will pick one out and I will say, like, how does that work, actually? And then I, I will expect that, you, that you're able to describe it in, in a concise way, like, what it is, what is the concept behind it, when to use it. Uh, yeah. You can provide your buzzwords, too. Like, some people, yeah. like myself, I hate them. I will, like, if I see buzzwords, when I suspect a buzzword, I will literally grill on the theory of every single one of them. Like any one of the ones I see. But I will say to uh, chime about the uh, AN, it's funny because uh, I actually, that's one of the buzzwords I hate. But I will say a good answer for that I usually would suggest if you really want to use that word is, and you got to ask that question is it's actually just a stacked uh, logistic regression. And you ensemble many, many different ones of them and you pass your results over to the next logistic stack over and over again. So, um, what would you say to someone who's interested in pursuing MD and uh, wants to have some data science background and is considering an MS also before going to that school? But, uh, so this, so this person is uh, currently a, a physics major, a physics CS major. Uh, she has a strong interest in machine learning and she wants to be a, a doctor down the line. She's considered, there's a five year master's program here, and so she's considering getting an MS in. Uh, Data science, uh -huh. or well, for some machine learning sure. concentration, and then then going to med school the year after. Do you I, think hey, do you think this is a valuable uh, thing, or do you think just uh, opportunities for doctors with uh, machine learning? Well, if she wants to go, so actually we can both talk about this. Uh, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to usually be placed in three institution types. Okay, it's either an academic center, meaning uh, what is an academic center associated to us? Rob Wood Johnson. Yeah. Rob Wood Johnson. Research huh? A research hub. There we go. So there we go. Rob Wood Johnson is technically a hospital, but it's an academic center that is connected to a school or has services that uh, provides a space for research, provides a space for students to learn the residence programs of sorts as well. Then there's a community center, which is like, um, I don't even know if we have many community centers in New Jersey. Uh, there's a couple community centers where it's just like literally going to a dentist office. It's a space specifically for a doctor to treat a patient and they might or might not have all the machinery that they necessarily need. 
Then there's finally the federal center, the, so the VA, DOD. These guys are only there to do the job of a doctor, mostly because they are overworked and underpaid. They're not about to do anything more than that. So if these are the three options, and you're trying to find some sort of bridge between MD and MS and data, the only place that I would ever see that making sense is in the academic center, where you could be a doctor and you could be a researcher. Then, sure, you know what, I'm doing some sort of a clinical study, and it so sort of happens that I need to be able to uh, use my data really well. But I'm going to go back to the question that I started with, which is why. If you're going to be a doctor and you're going to go down that road, there's probably somebody there who's going to do that for you. They, they specifically pursue their life and career to support you. So there's not going to be very many use cases that I can think of where you're going to need both skill sets. Uh, given that you've just told me that she's doing a CS and physics major, that already tells me that she's going down a very different path from an MD. Because if I'm going to be an MD, I'm going to do bio or art sciences, because I know undergraduate really doesn't matter, as long as I was <coughs> past the MCAT. So I don't necessarily see why that would be the case, but sure, if she wants to get all this. I mean, it, it, she wouldn't be like uh, a regular doctor, she'd be a researcher. Uh, you know, then you just pursue an MD. With, uh, within the MD programs, depending on where you go, they will teach you fundamentals around how to do basic data analytics. Because you don't need much for a doctor, it's really more around um, like statistical tests to ensure that the integrity of the data. Exactly. Exactly. Most of that is, is very much enabled, just not doing machine learning. Fine. Okay. I, I don't know much about medical school, but what, if, what I can tell you is that, let's say if, if your friend wants to do the machine, we are this machine, is uh, can play the role as, as, a, as, a, as a doctor. You want to train a machine has higher diagnosis accuracy than a real human being doctor. If she wants to build such a machine, then I think her knowledge in computer science and in data science might be more important than the medical. Because in our company, when, uh, we have a task. Let's say we observe a patient. We know this patient has some early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We want to predict whether this, this patient will be diagnosed next year of Alzheimer's disease or not. So this, this is the goal as if I'm a doctor. I train a machine to predict whether it will be diagnosed or not. In, in this use case, in this example, I don't think the medical knowledge play a very important role because things become more and more data driven nowadays. Even, I, I think maybe a PhD in computer science is more useful. Maybe to conclude with something that would be helpful to most of the people here in the audience. Uh, what is your opinion about whether these folks here should go work for one of the big tech companies versus an uh, applied data science lab in various different industries? So that's some of the choices that many people here might What are the choices? Uh, working for a data data Google, Facebook, correct? One, sure, that's always going to be there. Or joining one of the data science teams and various other companies, like the ones you are representing, the ASM. Yeah, so I did find an offer from Google to go to Sell Team. Um, I see it fairly dichotomous. Uh, actually, so I'll give a more professional and then personal experience. Professional experience, it depends on what you want to do. I wanted to solve problems and make money in the process. Primarily make money in the process, solving problems with the secondary bit. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity that I saw in industry was a particular lack of capability, and I, of course I can't speak generally, so I'm speaking for pharma right now, and somewhat in the, in the consulting space as well. A particular general uh, lack of capability. So let's say people are very good at Excel, and we're talking about people graduating with the ability to build regression models and machine learning models. A lot of that doesn't exist, and uh, it, it may feel like that, but in the industry, usually it doesn't very much exist. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that you can solve and, and certainly look like a hero very easily. The second is there is this clear desire in the industry, because of all these capabilities, to build that in-house. So a lot of companies are trying to hire people so that they can actually build that capability and stand it up without having to rely on consulting firms, without having to pay other people to do that for them. So there's a lot of desire and meaning essentially gives you a platform to gradually grow the company and the entry, uh, the, the entry is not quite as, uh, as looming and threatening. Mm -hmm. 
Then there's the Google world, which is we expect you to be up here already, even though you're coming from undergrad. Kind of. That's how it feels in the interviews as well. And the work that you do here is going to be a lot of fun, but you're probably going to be only doing the work. I mean, that's your life for at least two, three years is, is the balance that I have I faced. I chose the former over the latter, and of course you have both. On a personal experience, I think Google is certainly more fun on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I went through a grueling one-month interview session to be uh, hired as a, as a manager, and so they put me in there. I was on their campus the whole time, and it is, it is awesome. I'm not gonna lie, I thought it was the greatest place in the world. Only for me to realize, I was there for an interview. I was on campus for maybe three, four hours a day, and there were people who would come in at seven in the morning and wouldn't leave until nine. And I reached out to people, and I was like, is this your regular day to day life? Said, yeah, if you go to Google, either you're working there like a dog, or you're actually probably gonna do your own startup kind of thing. Those are like the two major exit options you have. So if you want, to dedicate your life to your work for a couple of years and really build a very strong, deep capability in a very major and very successful company, makes sense, go in that direction. If you want a much more, um, less threatening entrance, but a much more natural progression that's a little easier and gives you a little bit more balance in life, industry. That's kind of how I look at it right now. You're talking about the data science sphere. Data science sphere. I'm gonna be, I'll be pretty candid. I don't know if any undergrads can get into the data science sphere from a big tech company necessarily. Uh, you might be able to do a swing it in as an intern uh, and be really good. But you're gonna talk. We're talking about like you gotta be top of the class, good in that aspect and very very nimble in how your thought process is. I don't like to sell those bets. I don't like to tell people like yeah just do like go for that. Kind of Right? But if you're talking about just in general, big regard, if you want to enter the data science world, a big tech company is definitely a big help. Because at that point, you don't have to be on a data science team. You could be like a software, a junior software engineer. And that name, brand name is still there. So they're going to be like, awesome, you did a year at a junior in Google, let's get you a data science position at X later on, at Facebook or whatever. So that's very, very valuable. But I would say, like, if you're looking to jump and be a data scientist right off the bat, which is perfectly understandable, it's great. Uh, then you have to, you probably your best bet is actually to look at something outside of the larger tech companies, which give you a lot of opportunities, and some of them are just as good, if not better, in terms of opportunity you're given, the fun and the challenge you're going to have with the team and the role you do. Uh, but and I would say, like, that is. If you have a CS background, you're in an advantage because that's the, one of the hottest degrees in the data science field right now. There are many different things that a CS uh, bachelors happen to cover that, yeah, if you, of course, if you have an MS or a PhD, it's even better, but if you only have a bachelor's, it is one of the more ideal majors. Um, and on top of that, uh, I would also say another thing to consider, your first job, uh, if you aren't looking at one of the big tech names, uh, look for a team that would you can learn from a team that is, you know, where you could see yourself like being able to grow and then apply additional knowledge to your next position. So I, I think one uh, major difference, still, which is made maybe more a subjective one, uh, but the advantage of working in uh, the manufacturing industry in general is that you actually also have an impact on material life. You know, okay, it all depends on your preferences. If you play, if you if you like playing with media, then you likely don't don't care for for, for material uh, impact on life. Or uh, if you if, if, if you like, uh, let's say like navigation, and you go for a work for a base app, yeah, then of course your product is the software, your product is the apps, is, is and it has an impact on life. A lot of people use it. You make you make people lives better. Uh, but I, I still think I, I really appreciate that I work for a company that actually produces chemicals, so we do data science, but we also, these models are a bad example, we don't produce them, but we uh, just imagine we do, uh, we, we do, we do produce a lot of everyday chemicals that are appearing uh, in, in wherever your city is, the <laughs> partially produced by us, this tablecloth, the chairs, uh, the light bulbs, so it is, it's like our chemicals end up 
in every aspect of everyday life. And uh, so the, the, the mission of the company is we create chemistry for a sustainable future. So we also have the vision that we want to uh, do that in a way that it's going to be sustainable in a couple of hundred years. And data science helps that, both in terms of material development, that is where I'm headed now in my new role, artificial intelligence, uh, creating new molecules, new chemicals, new compounds. Uh, but also uh, data science helps in manufacturing them more cost effectively, better quality, uh, and eventually also in business. So that is, that is for me a reason to stay in the more applied industries.